And that's assuming that the fantasy world of, hey, I, I just taxed the crap out of my country, took all the available investment capital out of the country, and consumed it in taxes and government spending, but the economy will still maintain the same GDP growth and there'll never be another recession, another virus. The inability to have adult conversations around here of the proposals are lunacy. The great politicking. You go home, stand up in front of town hall, tell them these things, you're lying to them. And they, everyone applauds, oh, I really want free stuff. And then you take the best estimate, and understand this number is probably double last year, the 2021, than it will be in the future years because this has huge amounts of the COVID fraud. Many of us believe the COVID unemployment may be the single biggest fraud maybe in world history. We've seen some underlying reports, it could be a couple hundred billion dollars, but let's pretend that the fraud and waste of 2021 was something we could capture. We can get every damn dollar. That's $662 billion. That's amazing. Now, it's a one-time thing. You, you, you get it back. We were able to collect every dollar, stop all the waste and fraud. Great. Except we're heading towards $2 trillion deficits at the end of the decade. So we took care of about a quarter of it. Now, we need to work our heinies off to get every dollar of waste and fraud out of the system. We need to stop designing insane systems where we hand out money and we're going to figure out if you should have gotten it a year, two years, three years later. But we got to stop the fantasy that there are simple solutions. Last week I stood here and I showed the board saying, do you know if we got rid of every single dollar of foreign aid, those, so the, what, the $38 billion of foreign aid. It paid for about 11 days of borrowing, not spending, borrowing. I know we've been told over and over, hey, there's simple solutions, tax the rich, get rid of foreign aid, waste and fraud. They're rounding errors in the scale of what's hitting us. But there are solutions, and damn it, I need us all, whether you be on the left or the right, or, or the public that's just trying to understand, be willing to think differently. Be willing to stop this insanity of, well, we'll just do entitlement reform. Yeah, like that's going to ever happen. How many members of Congress are going to come here and vote? I cut Social Security, I cut Medicare. It's never going to happen, nor should we. Those are promises we have a moral obligation to keep. Now the moral obligation is, how do you finance them? How do you keep them? And every member who refuses to tell you the truth about the math is also putting them at peril. And you can't lie. My brothers and sisters on the left, you got to tell the truth. Playing this game, oh, the 2017 tax reform, oh, it crashed revenues. Do you understand we are trillion dollars higher receipts for those of us on Ways and Means Committee? than we were when we did the 2017 tax reform. It's a spending problem. If I had come to you in 2017 saying, hey, four years from now, we're going to be taking in $1 trillion additional revenue, you would have laughed your hiney off. But we did. But how can we still be so upside down? How can in this year, when we're still not doing the crazy level of COVID spending, we're still a quarter trillion dollars, and we're only, what, into our second, third month of this fiscal year? So I beg of us, it, it, it's, you look at charts like this and you understand it really is a spending. It's a structural spending problem. And as I was just showing you, the really uncomfortable slide over the next 30 years, it's Medicare and Social Security. It is what it is. And you look at the projections, and, th and this slide is incredibly important for all my junior economists out there. We have times over the, since the 1960s till today 
We've had very high tax marginal tax rates. We've had low marginal tax rates. And guess what? We always seem to come in with high tax rates, low tax rates, good economy, poor economy. We always seem to ultimately come in right about 19 percent of the size of the economy in revenues, in receipts, in taxes. I need you to think about that. So if I want more revenue, I need an economy that grows the size of the nation, the wealth of this nation, the prosperity, the poor get less poor, the working middle class get rewarded for their work. Do policies that grow, and the benefit of that is that's how you get more tax receipts. Because you got to look here, understand that our spending is heading towards 30 percent of the entire size of the economy. I know these are geeky numbers, but those are stunning numbers. And yet the number of times, and I, and I showed you before all the projections, well, we'll just raise taxes. And then you look at our history, when we've done that, the growth, the size of the economy have flatlined, or they shrank. And so the total dollars in aren't what you prayed for. Lack of science, the lack of math, the lack of basic creativity. And then there's my holy grail. And this is truly the holy grail. And, and, and I truly, I pray to the dear Lord, let, let what I'm reading be true. 33% of all America's healthcare spending is diabetes. 31% of all Medicare spending is diabetes. Now most of that's type two, it's not type one. And type two, in many ways, there's a lot to it. It's ultimately an autoimmune, but it is partially self-inflicted. Is this body willing to have one of the most difficult political debates and conversations it's ever considered in the modern times? Are we willing to change the farm bill? Are we willing to change the incentives what we incentivize our brothers and sisters to eat? Are we willing to incentivize our brothers and sisters to be healthy? You all saw the numbers of the misery this place brought to the nation with the shutdowns and how many of the zip codes around this country have doubled their obesity numbers. But why this is important is apparently we've been on the cusp. We've had a handful of people who, who look like they've been cured of type 1 diabetes. And it's, look, it's less than a year. Maybe it ultimately doesn't work. But this is a big deal. Why aren't we working on it? Why aren't we? Because if it's 31% of all Medicare spending and we were able to help our brothers and sisters who are getting their feet cut off and Luke going blind, wouldn't that be the compassionate thing? Wouldn't that be the moral thing? Instead of this damn conversation we have here, well, let's build more clinics so people can manage their misery. I beg of you, if we're on the edge of a cure for, you know, you saw last week it finally got approved, hemophilia, we got a single shot cure, really expensive, work out the financing. Cystic fibrosis, we may be on the cusp. Sickle cell anemia. Why doesn't this place seem to give a damn about people's misery and suffering? Oh, by the way, they're part of the 5%, that's the 50% that's also really good economics. I ask anyone that's watching this, think differently. Curing our brothers and sisters, fixating on economic growth, crashing the price of technology by legalizing technology is the only path I can come up with that saves us from the debt crushing. And the fact of the matter is, if you actually look at the models, it means the next couple de decades could be really prosperous. I just need this place to act very, very differently. And with that, Mr. Speaker Pro Tem, I yield back to John. Why am I even more dour right now than I was several months ago? It's inflation, it's the cost of everything, it's the affordability in our society. But you're crushing people, and we're gonna walk through a little bit of that. But you've got to understand, and, and I'm sorry, I'm going to geek out on interest rates for a moment, but, but then I'm going to try to show what it actually means to everyone in this country. What we're doing to you, and, and so many of our brothers and sisters out there, you don't understand how 
oh, I'm sorry, it, it's, a, it's a sort of high level technical economic term, how um, um, screwed you are. So let's sort of walk through this. We were building budgets a year ago on an assumption that US sovereign debt, when you did the you know, two year, the five years, the 10 years, the 20 years, the 30 years, okay, the blended interest rate, the weighted daily average, there's all these fun calculations. We're actually really interesting stuff. We were originally about 1.78, we thought would be our mean interest rate. Then last, what was it, um, was this March or May? March, um, we recalculated because of this thing called inflation. Oh, we're gonna be up to 2.10. Then the reality of it is at, we ended up at a recalculation of, hey, the US mean now is heading towards 2.85, and that's on the 10 year. We have some economists around us who are starting to say, it's going higher. It's going higher. And I'm gonna show you a couple things here of what happens to us as a country if the way the Federal Reserve has to stop inflation is raising, raising, raising interest rates, breaking the labor market, because you understand within there, even though there's this delay effect, that also means what you and I have to pay the interest back on all the borrowing, and the biggest part of the borrowing cycle has not even hit us yet because we're just now starting to absorb and get ready for the huge spike in costs because of our demographics. Remember, baby boomers, the final tail end of the baby boomers is moving into their retirement benefits. And as they get slightly older and a little bit older, a little bit older, the Medicare costs start to really go up and we haven't even hit that financing cycle. It's coming. What happens if we have to finance that at the higher interest rates? So you start looking at some of this. Three months, T-bill, back in March, 0.2, and that was our Biden administration estimate for the three-year. The actual three-year right now, 1.75. Let's see, what's the difference between a 0.20 and a 1.75? Can anyone say a whole lot? This may not mean much to you, but this is money your taxes are going to be paying back. So here's the punchline. I'm gonna make it really, really, really simple. What if this inflationary cycle stuck with us? What if instead of that, what was it, um, 1.78 or even the 2.3% interest rate on US sovereign debt, what if it were two points higher, just 2% higher, which functionally 15 years ago, that's where we were at. Remember, we actually had a reprieve, completely fake economic, reprieve for a decade with artificially low interest rates. So we we're borrowing, 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 and the Federal Reserve kept interest rates lower, particularly since 2008. And now we're about to pay the cost of it. So what would happen if we paid that 2% higher? Functionally at the end, and, and my math is a little bit less, the end of 30 years, 100% of all tax receipts of all taxes, all tariffs, all, all, everything that comes into the government, 100% goes just to pay interest. You gotta understand how sensitive we are as a government, as a society, as a country now, how fragile we've made ourselves because we structurally, we're gonna borrow what, another one to 1 1.3, there's one estimate, 1.4 trillion dollars this year. We're never paying anything off. We're borrowing, and it gets worse and worse and worse and worse because our demographics as we get older, unless we crash the price of healthcare. So that's gonna be two weeks from now, we're gonna talk about things we could do to accomplish that. But are you prepared to live in a country that if our mean interest rate goes up 2% stays there? All tax receipts go just to cover our interests. There's no more government, there's no more military, there's no more benefits, there's no more social security, there's no more Medicare. This is why it's so crucial around here to have an honest conversation that where people put batteries in their calculator. Instead, this place is living on theater. Oh, modern monetary policy, we can spend all the money we want, look, nothing happened, oh, got it, didn't work. 
And in many ways, I can show you right now, the largest tax increase in modern history has happened in the last year. If the fact of the matter, you live in my Phoenix Scottsdale area, and you are a working person, you are a hardworking taxpayer, and you have not had a pay hike, do you realize you've lost six weeks, maybe more, of your labor? We're still at 12.1% inflation in my community. You've lost six weeks of your labor. If I'd walked in and said, hey, I'm going to take a month and a half of your salary, and that's going to be my new tax hike, you would have lost your mind. But if we do it through this thing called inflation, where we strip the affordability of your groceries and your gasoline and everything else in your life, did you notice it? Well, you knew there's a problem. You know life has got much harder. You know sometimes you get to the checkout stand and you're taking things back because the price just doesn't work on your budget. And the perverse thing, you're going to see a chart here, my next one, where actually there's going to be this little drop in sort of the debt to GDP and those things. And that's because that inflation actually has been a tax. We lowered the value of your income. We lowered the value of your savings. By the same time, we lowered the value of all this debt because we're going to pay it back with what we call inflated dollars, which is wonderful up until the next year or two when we have to refinance that debt and refinance the debt and refinance the new spending at the higher interest rates, and then that little benefit of taxing you through inflation goes away, and we're off to the races, and it becomes hell. And remember, this has brought down other countries for hundreds of years, and it's right in front of us, and no one seems to come behind these microphones and A, talk about it, educate about it. And for the last couple of years, I've come here behind these microphones and tried to show solutions and then drives the lobbyists out of their minds. So let's take a look at this. And let's see if I can make this make work. This is deficits during the Biden administration, fiscal year 23, budget baseline versus a 1% rise in interest. Okay, do we all agree that we've had at least a 1% rise in interest rates? Yes. So do you see this one little bit of a fall right there? So this orange is what happens when you tack on um, the additional interest. That little fall is functionally the fact we devalued your dollar. That's, that's our little benefit from taxing you with a way you didn't know. But then, boom, and functionally, the budget cycle we're about to work on is the 24 budget cycle. You're basically going to have a deficit of 1.4 trillion, and then it, boom, it's 1.5 trillion. You get out a couple more years, you're heading towards 1.75 trillion. In less than a decade, you're well over $2 trillion a year in just borrowing. And this chart explodes if we go beyond that 1% rise in interest rates. Structurally, even if I remove saying, hey, we're going to go back to living in that world of that fantasy artificially low interest rate, we're still heading towards $2 trillion a year borrowing. It just takes 10 years. This is insane. Functionally, right in here, interest will be just, just the basic borrowing. You know, all of defense, um, a whole bunch of um, discretionary and other things will be all live on borrowed money. And here, and look, most people have no idea what the concept of debt to GDP, it's, it's the concept of here's the size of my economy. And yes, we're borrowing all this money, but look how big my economy is and that economy's ability to finance, just like your income finances your credit cards. And as long as your income keeps going up faster than the debt on your credit cards, you, know, you can live, you're, you're gonna be okay. What happens when your economy isn't growing, your income isn't growing as fast as you're borrowing on those credit cards? At a certain point, it comes to an end. So if you listen to the floor the last couple of days, how many times have you had someone come to this floor and actually show they even care no, but we'll give some great speeches about, hey, 50 you know, illegal crossers of our border got shipped to Martha's Vineyard. 
Oh, come to my state. That's like every few minutes. I'm a border state. Come down to Yuma with me. Let me show you what the hell's actually going on. But Washington, D.C., my brothers and sisters in the left, I'm still waiting for them to come behind these microphones and apologize for functionally what is the biggest tax in U.S. history. You know, we're now rivaling what happened to this country in the late 70s, very early 80s. Except the crisis is much more complex now. And here's why. Yes, you had the wage, wage spirals, the price spirals, the fuel spirals of the late 70s. But you had a beneficial demographics. You had lots of available workers. Today we have this crazy thing going on where our available work population because of our demographics. My fear is the Federal Reserve is going to have to break the back of employment in this country to squeeze out inflation. Are we all ready for that? Because this legislature, this Congress, as Republicans, we've come behind these mics multiple times. I've introduced legislation saying, look, what is inflation? Inflation is too many dollars chasing too few goods. You can do one of two things. You can squeeze the dollars out of society, so all that free money that the Democrats gave away over the last couple of years, raise interest rates, pull liquidity out, take it away. Or we can make more stuff. I'm going to show a couple boards here of what's happened to productivity the last couple quarters. We're crashing. Our productivity is crashing. When you do the fancy math and you are not making more stuff, it means what the Federal Reserve is going to have to do to us is more and more brutal. And I think actually some of the markets are actually starting to wake up the last couple days and start to understand the malfeasance, the economic malfeasance of this place. But then again, I sometimes wonder if I work with a bunch of people that don't own a calculator or didn't show up to their high school economics class, because this isn't that complicated. We use big fancy words. We do brilliant virtue signaling. But the math is brutal. And I think we need to wake up when you saw what the president did, what was it, on 60 Minutes a couple days ago, complete disconnect from what's happening to the middle class and the poor going on in this country. So we, all, we have a bit of the tyranny of the clock, as you know, so I'm going to try to do this somewhat rapidly. A um, lot of speechifying today and frustrated because um, I, I don't have an elegant or delicate way to say this, but people keep making crap up. So let's actually walk through some basic math so we understand something. Does anyone here have any memory of last fall when a number of us were coming behind these microphones and getting ready to talk about the, the winter that was coming? Do you remember the discussion of how high the power bills, the heating bills were going to be? It's because fuel prices, hydrocarbon prices, didn't just go up because of the Russian invasion. If you look at the charts, if you look at the charts, this began functionally when the left took power. It really began in 2018 and then really took off when they had unified control. It didn't just happen. Matter of fact, there's a number of charts out there and futures contracts that were basically saying the prices you are seeing today at the gas pump, they just showed up about six months early that that's actually where we were going because consumption and supply wasn't keeping up because of what we've done to ourselves. And you see it already. Do you not remember last October and September crossing $6 on natural gas? It was already coming at us and it was our own fault. And how does this craziness happen? You know, we keep getting folks coming behind the microphone and saying, well, it's because of Keystone Pipeline. It is a little bit. It's becoming, it's because of some of the drilling bans. It is a little bit. It is mostly because over, particularly this last year, but also going back when the left took power after the 2018 election, they basically started to threaten capital markets that if you are a company 
and you invest in hydrocarbons, I think the SEC should look into you. If your CalPERS, our pension fund, and you invest in hydrocarbons, we're going to look down upon that. Matter of fact, we're going to encourage universities and other pension funds no more investing in hydrocarbons. What did you think was going to happen? So when you actually see this frustration and the absolute distorted rhetoric coming out of the White House, well, there's 9,000 drilling permits out there. Okay, I think most of America already understands that's lunacy of, you know, you get a permit, you find out if there's any hydrocarbons in the ground, but how do you go to capital markets and get any money to stick that straw in the ground? And this continued. Now, over and over, Biden administration, you know, Biden executive orders missed the mark, and it was actually talking about the Treasury coming at anyone that's putting capital, capital markets, into hydrocarbons. Understand what you're paying at the gas pump, what you're paying to heat your house. You voted for this. If you voted for the left, if you voted for them in 18, if you voted for them in 20, you voted for this. You voted for that price because this is what they promised us. Remember the, dis the, the, the discussions here, the debates here. We're going to make it so you can't raise money to finance a pipeline, to finance new hydrocarbon extractions, to finance natural gas. And what's so ironic about this, I mean, just quote after quote after quote, pension systems and others, the idea was strangle. Strangle hydrocarbon extraction, oil and gas, and make it so they don't have the capital to open up new wells, to invest in more efficiencies. And the left actually got what they wanted. But do you, are they now willing to admit that they got what they wanted there? You know, we now are seeing $5 gasoline, you see the price of natural gas, well guess what, congratulations, we burned 23 percent more coal last year because they made natural gas so expensive, we moved from one fuel source that was dramatically cleaner than coal, but you raised the price so high, and remember power generation is regulated, power plant after power plant after power plant around America moved back to coal. So now you have the brain trust in the administration say things like, well, go buy an electric car. Except that electric car is going to be powered by coal. Because the dramatically cleaner burning fuel of natural gas, you've just made really expensive. A couple months ago, we came here to the floor and talked about natural gas and the concerns the left has said over, well, what about methane? And showing them that, you know, some breakthroughs of really inexpensive ways to capture that methane. And, and, and there's a rational argument there. Met methane is a nine to one, but has a, only now a, a shorter half-life of what is considered to be a greenhouse gas. But instead of saying, hey, we're going to look for technologies that deal with the problem there, the left's opinion is, well, let's wipe them out. Because those who invest in green energy finance and write checks to Democrats. You know, the, the Green Mafia basically owns the Democrat Party. And then you go look at other just absurdities that is Democrat policy. And, and sorry, I had to grab an older slide. Do you realize the amount of baseload nuclear we have in this country that's going offline? You do realize over this 10-year period, the United States is going to get dirtier. And this is even before the left functionally raised the price of natural gas so much that power plants moved back to coal. We're moving so much clean baseload nuclear off the grid that it doesn't even offset every bit of photovoltaic and wind we've put on the grid. So we give lots of pretty speeches here. We do lots of virtue signaling, but the math is the math is the math. The virtue signaling creating policy has actually raised more greenhouse gases. Look what Germany did by shutting down its baseload nuclear. 
Now they burn massive amounts of coal. They got dirtier. And you've heard speech after speech here today about how much we despise Putin. But we also know his propaganda wing absolutely supported the left's movement to strangle these hydrocarbons. This is what you get when you make crappy policy. It didn't happen overnight. It's going to take us years to fix this mess. Can I beg the Democrats? Stop hurting people. Stop making the poor poor. Stop crushing the middle class. Come back to sensibility. And, oh, guess what? There might be a bonus there, and that is all the coal that's being burnt, all the dirty imports, you'd actually get a benefit of the greenhouse gases. But you got to come back and do math again. And with that, Speaker Pro Ten, I think I'm up against my time, so I yield back. First thing, I want to go to Geek Town for a moment, just to put something in perspective of a thing I've come to this floor since January talking about inflation. Now, how many of you remember the discussions we were all having, actually it was being more had at us, that inflation was transitory? And now we sort of apologize, the Federal Reserve, the Treasury Secretary Yellen, um, hopefully the White House, so the White House seems to be disconnected from reality, that it's not transitory. If you saw the numbers that came out last Thursday, Friday, we have something called structural. What does that mean to anyone? Um, does this place even care to understand? So first, let's do the first bit of geeky. When you hear a discussion that the yield curve is inverted, how many of you immediately reach over to your television and go, oh God, I have the wrong channel on, and turn it off? It's not that complicated. It's a way of people using big words to try to sound smart. Inverted yield curve just means, hey, I expect over the next two years to have higher inflation so the value of my dollar goes down faster than I do over the 10 years. That means if I buy a 10-year bond, I might be willing to take an interest rate here, but I expect inflation to be so high in the next two years, I want a higher interest rate. Because theoretically, it's real simple, when things take longer, you should have more risk and therefore want a higher interest rate. Why is this important to a conversation on the floor of the house? Go look on your favorite financial website right now. The two years has a higher interest rate than the 10 year. The five years has a higher interest rate than a 10 year. The seven year has a higher interest rate than the 10 year. That is the markets telling you that they expect inflation to be with us for years. You also saw in the inflation report we received last week, you saw my brothers and sisters on the left, hey, energy prices are down, yay, oh, oh why is the core inflation so high? Congratulations, you did it. Functionally, 30 years of substantial stability in inflation, and we got ourselves a wage price spiral. We dumped so much money in functionally March 2001, so much money into the economy that it set off what's called a pri wage price spiral. Wages go up. You got to raise your prices. Well, if you raise your prices, you got to pay your workers more. Well, if you pay your workers more, you got to wait, raise your prices. What happens when that becomes embedded into the structure of the economy and energy goes up and down? And you know, how many of our friends on the left keep saying, well, it's Ukraine? Of course, if you remove you know, energy prices, you still have inflation built into the core. This is really, really horrible, dangerous, brutal. Does anyone here give a damn about poor people? Does anyone here care about the working middle class? Does anyone care about people trying to retire? You gotta understand the brutality. Because where's that money go?
Under the Speaker's announced policy of January 4, 2021, the Chair recognizes the gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Schweikert, for 30 minutes. Um, thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, there's so many things we all want to talk about and share about, and, and sometimes, you know, as members of Congress, you know, we run in front of microphones and we sort of do um, the shiny loud object of the day because, let's face it, that gets us retweets and Facebook and those things. Um, but they're often trite. So I have a handful of things I want to walk through, but there's going to be a constant theme here. And I'm, I'm not trying to be mean, but the theme really is, and I think my facts will back me up, that the left's, the Democrat policies, if you look at particularly the last 12 months, have made life more miserable for Americans, have made working class and you know, poor working class poorer, and actually are crushing sort of the hope um, so, so I want to walk through um, a couple economic things. I, I'm blessed to be the senior Republican on joint economics. So a hand, handful of economists that you know, work for our side, there's a handful that work for the left side. Um, and we've been digging and digging and digging, trying to understand the inflation data, um, the amount of cash that's chasing goods, what's happening in productivity. And dear Lord, I hope I'm wrong, but I'm starting to see numbers that look like we are on the cusp of a wage price spiral. And let's sort of walk through our basic economics. You all remember your high school economics class, particularly those of us who are old enough to have been in high school in the end of the 70s. Um, businesses raise prices because their costs are going up. You hit typically, just like we we're doing right now, you know, the new year, people are getting their wage hikes. Many of those wage hikes, most of those wage hikes are nothing more than to keep up with inflation. So you end up with this spike. So there was a handful of folks on the Democrat side that were saying, well, look at the December number. It wasn't spiking as much as the previous months. Wait till you see the January numbers when the wages come in. And then you end up with this world saying, well, now um, businesses, organizations, government, others have to keep raising their costs raising their prices, um, raising their taxes, others, to keep up because they just had to raise wages, not for our brothers and sisters who are out there working, to live better, but basically to just be able to purchase the same things. Except at the end of 2021, Americans were poor. The fact of the matter is the average American fell about 2.7 to 38 percent poorer because inflation grew faster than their wages did. But there's lots of things in the economic literature, and I know I'm geeking out a bit, that you start to end up in this seesaw effect. They call a wage price spiral. Well, businesses keep having to raise their, um, their costs because now they have to raise the wages, and it becomes a very, very ugly circle. And a bit of trivia. Um, how many here would immediately say, well, go back to the 1980s, particularly the early 1980s, it was Paul Volcker jacking up interest rates to just extraordinary levels that squeezed out inflation. That's actually only part of the story. Um, if you actually look at the math, during that time, um, there were the Reagan tax cuts, the first round of them, and they created a great spike in productivity. Because one of the things inflation is, is once again, I have too much money chasing too few goods. So raising interest rates, making everything more expensive, still doesn't do anything to make sure you're making more goods, more services to fill up that vacuum to remove that inflationary pressure. And you actually even see some of that data after we did tax reform here at the very, very end of 2017 when you saw this spike in productivity, you saw actually a really pretty impressive spike for two years of wages and actually falling inflation. And why was that? It's because expensing and other things we did in tax reform, um, repatriation, getting 
billions, hundreds of billions of dollars coming back from around the world back into the country, actually raised productivity, lowered prices. That's the holy grail. And right now, almost every policy that the administration, and I hate to say this body is engaging in, are counter to that. So we're going to walk through a couple things here. And our argument is really simple. Almost every major policy set being moved forward, and I don't think it's purposeful. I think it's just a misunderstanding of the most basic economics that my Democrat brothers and sisters are doing is actually making life more miserable. And, and I don't think it's purposeful, but it is economics. So let's walk through the facts, to just the actual math. And I know this is always uncomfortable, but if you actually look at the data that came in, it's actually, um, when you look at the expenditures, because I'm using this slide, this is actually a 2019 slide, but it's important to set the base. Our brothers and sisters who are in the lowest quartiles, and I hate that term, but it's what we use as economics, dramatically more of their income goes to pay for housing. Dramatically more goes then to pay for their transportation, their food. Those in the upper incomes, that's not where they live. And think about what's gone on in this last year. And most everyone that's in this room, probably most everyone who's watching this, we're the people who have savings. We have retirement accounts. We have 401ks. Life has gotten more expensive for us, but our assets, how many of you have a home that's gone up dramatically in value? Think about those lower income quartiles, that working poor, that middle class, that lower middle class, do they have a home? Are they renters? How much of their cost is their transportation just trying to provide housing? What we've allowed to happen inflation-wise is just brutalizing them. And when you actually start to understand what the policies from this last year have done, and I'm going to show a number of these things showing that the left's policies are actually crushing the poor, the working poor, and the middle class. Um, the, uh, the, the difference here, when you see this type of graph, is we're trying to sort of demonstrate that it's both the effects on populations where you are income-wise. If you're in this lower income, how much more your cost of your life is because of inflation. So this is almost just a pure inflation of who benefits, who doesn't benefit. So if you're a homeowner, if you're someone with lots of assets and the stock market's been really good to you, you've turned out ahead. If you are like most in the middle class and lower, your standard of living has gone down. And there's this rule of thumb from the top line what are the two things you do to make the working poor poor? I've said this dozens of times behind this microphone. It's inflation, and it's opening up the border. There is this economic theory, and, and this is actually old literature. It's like 20 years old. And it actually had a number of left groups as part of the authors who basically said, if you look at the working poor, this is a population who probably didn't finish high school. What they sell is their labor, their willingness to work, their willingness to sweat. What happens when you flood your society, functionally in one year, with a couple million people with similar skill sets? You know, it's just basic math. You functionally have devalued the, the economics, the value of their labor. So, so, so you've given them the double whammy. You've created inflation, which affects the poor and the middle class more dramatically. Because you saw from the first chart how much more of their resources go to pay for housing, to pay for transportation, to pay for food. And now you make them compete against a couple million people with similar skill sets. You know, these aren't IT jobs. This isn't someone who is at the top of the wage scale and creates a multiplier of productivity in the society because they're inventing some new app. This is the person who's hanging drywall, working their hearts out. It's a tough job. Their back is aching at the end of the night. 
and now they look out and there's a couple of million other people in society with similar skill sets. It's a level of misunderstanding that what some folks will come behind these microphones and pretend they're being compassionate, not understanding the cruelty of inflation and having an open border and how many working poor are getting crushed on this. But I want to go a bit further. So as you start to look at the inflation level, you got to understand, 7% was sort of the national, national number, right? In markets like mine, in the Phoenix area, we're at 9.7% inflation in 2021. So now a lot of that's because I'm from a growth area. Lots of people are abandoning the Californias and the Illinois and moving into my neighborhood. So much of my inflation is actually housing. You know, we've already heard other people come behind the mics to, even today and talk about the cost of housing. Well, congratulations. In other parts of the country, it's not 7%. In mine, it's 9.7%. And when we look at the charts and the details, it really, really has hurt the working poor. And they're having trouble finding the most basic accommodations. And then we start to dig in more. And the economists have made it very clear that what was allowed to go on in 2021, and it's the economics warn of inflationary inequity. And the details are pretty clear. For those of you who have assets, you're gonna do okay. If you're part of half of America that doesn't have those few thousand dollars in the bank or owns the house or has the other assets, you've become poor. The policies are making you poor. And I know this is uncomfortable, but you can't keep campaigning and doing politics and saying, we care about the middle class, we care about the working poor, and then keep adopting policies that make them poorer. At some point, the math always wins. Not the virtue signaling, not the rhetoric, it's the math. And we are making half of our country poor. But one of the other projects we're working on in the joint economic side and a couple of us on the Ways and Means Committee is also trying to understand what other attributes are there? You know, I can keep coming to the microphone and talking about the open border and we have an administration that doesn't seem to give a darn because it's political. Their base has no trouble with a couple million undocumented folks coming into the country. Um, inflation is really, really ugly because the math is brutal. Do you have any sense how high interest rates have to go to squeeze out this inflation? I think there's this fantasy that four marginal rate increases this year somehow are going to tap down inflation. I will make you a crazy, per actually it's not crazy, it's based in math. Um, by at the final quarter of this year, you may be seeing 10% inflation. And I hope I'm wrong, but I was in front of this mic a year ago saying, I think we're going to be close to seven. And I actually underestimated it. And go back to my opening comments. I really, really, really see in the numbers. We're on the cusp of a wage price spiral and four marginal quarter point increases in interest rates ain't gonna cut it unless Congress dramatically starts to think about policies that spike productivity. Except you have a left that now it's an article of faith that tax reform, that expensing, these things we did in the tax code to bring back hundreds of billions of dollars back into the country, to get organizations to invest in plant and equipment to make workers more productive so they could be paid more. Well, we can't do that, except even the liberal economists agree it worked. And it turns out you need to be doing things like that. The left's Build Back Better social spending bill, when, because it de-links money transfer payments from work, every data set basically says it will continue to spike inflation and at the end of 10 years, you all, I, I, I came here with the paper. It makes it very clear at the end of 10 years, the working poor are poorer. 
because the way the left has designed these transfer payments without an expectation of participation in society and work. Um, I thought we learned this 25 years ago, but somehow math is heresy. So let's go, what are some of the other um, attributes that make our brothers and sisters in that lower middle class, working poor, in many of our neighborhoods, what, makes, what else makes them poor? Okay, we've touched on inflation. We've touched on flooding society with um, millions of people with similar skill sets. When was the last time you had someone remind us that the concentration of crime, for most of the members in this body, we don't live in neighborhoods that are going to be subject to crime. How many members here live behind a gate? How many members here have security? I did a ride along for four hours on Monday through North Central Phoenix. And neighborhood after neighborhood after neighborhood, the officer I rode with had almost, I think, almost like 28 years on, on this city of Phoenix police force. And it was the neighborhoods that were most disadvantaged had the most crime. We're driving away, okay, there's an assault here. You see the person in that apartment, they're a drug dealer. That's a, and you're realizing it's the folks who are in poverty are in the core of the crime. And then the left takes a position of basically having verbal violence towards law enforcement. But we know the data says if you look at the concentrations of poverty, one of the attributes that makes someone poor is when someone comes and steals their stuff. You're trying to work. Someone steals your tools. You're trying to survive. Someone breaks into your car or steals your automobile. It's another attribute that once again the left's policies is like this constant economic violence on the poor. And then you start to go on another thing we're working on. This one's much more complex, but it's starting to prove the theory is true. Um, how many of you have ever heard the discussion about health disparities? You know, our urban poor, my Native American populations, even rural poor, the health disparities. And it's absolutely true. Our brothers and sisters with renal failure, diabetes, these things who are concentrated, we can almost draw data circles around them and say, look at the income inequality of this neighborhood to a neighborhood it might be just down the street. And we've been trying to understand what are the attributes. And oddly enough, some of the attributes aren't race. They're health. They're crime. They're education. But the one that no one here has focused on is actually health. If you ever get a chance, and this is for anyone that's listening, try to find the data of those who are suffering type 2 diabetes and, and the concentration. Go find a heat map. And it becomes a really interesting discussion because that's I'm making is my fourth attribute is our brothers and sisters who are sicker. So the left's attitude is, well, it's good politics. We'll just put up a bunch more clinics. We'll help them manage their diabetes. Okay, that's an honorable thing. Wouldn't it be much more compassionate to cure, to disrupt? So we do know because it came out a year ago, but it's as if no one actually read it. We actually have the paper that was put together, um, a working paper series, Congressional Budget Office. It was functionally some of the data within the Democrats' HR3. And if you actually dig through the numbers within their working paper, it makes it clear that the Democrats, it's great politics. Hey, we're going to lower drug prices. But the way they go about doing it, a decade from now, so many cures don't come. And as the paper talks about, it's the very cures for things like potentially diabetes and other ailments that are concentrated in our poor population. So it's functioning. The left's policy on something like HR3, because if you think about their pricing mechanism where, you know, if a drug costs more than this amount of money, you can't have it. 
it's once again policy that says we're going to find a way for you to live with your misery, but we're going to make your living with your misery a little cheaper. Then I think the thing that's loving and more compassionate is we're going to find a way to cure it. It really is a different mindset, and that isn't Republican or Democrat. It's just compassion. But it may not be great politics. Because the fact of the matter is if you look at the mechanics within H.R. 3, the Democrats actually make big pharma more profitable and bigger and more powerful, and they wipe out the disruptors, the small biologics, the small pharma that's actually chewing away their book of business because they're curing the disease where big pharma over here is just maintaining it. It's just, it's the classic economic irony of this place acts like a protection racket. We give great speeches on how we're going to do this and then wink, wink, nod, nod. What actually is happening is you're locking in someone's oligopoly. And once again, if you go through the paper, it makes it really clear that the first couple of years, not much difference because it's what's already in the disruptive pharmaceutical pipeline. And we've done presentations here of, you know, a hundred new are under research and only a few actually succeed. But in about five, six years, you start to see a collapse of those cures. Welcome to Democrat policy once again. And we've come to the floor multiple times with H.R. 3. We've made a number of people very angry by referring it to it as the Big Pharma Protection Racket um, Act, excuse me. Um, but the math is the math. And now you still have additional CBO studies that make it clear we're telling the truth. It is what it is. And we've actually made proposals to our brothers and sisters on the left saying, we both are enraged at the price of pharmaceuticals. Believe it or not, there's other ways to get there. And one of the most magical things we can do for society is also some of the kickers to make sure that there's capital stacks and these other things that are a little geeky, but ways that that investment goes into the cures. So when you have things like a single shot cure for hemophilia, when you saw, the, I did this presentation back in December, we have a proof of concept of a cure for type 1 diabetes. These are going to be, at, at, at starting, they're going to be really expensive. They're going to be really difficult until we functionally turn it into a biofoundry and you, you build the capital stack, the tax code, the incentives to do lots of that. But I can show you in chart after chart, it saves society, it saves taxpayers a fortune in the future. Remember, last year's CBO math said in 29 years, we are $112 trillion in debt in publicly borrowed money in today's dollars. So that's inflation-adjusted dollars. And we know that number is going to spike once we get the math from this last fiscal year plugged in there. About 75% of that spending is just Medicare. That debt is Medicare. The other 25% is Social Security. The most powerful thing you can do for U.S. sovereign debt is disrupt the price of health care. And our argument is the greatest elegance is actually doing it by making people healthier. Um, there's one other I want to throw my frustration of Democrat policy. And my expertise is more Arizona and not the rest of the country. Um, we've seen the debate around here, lots of flowery words and almost no detail of the reality of what's underlying the piece of legislation. You know, our friends on the left will come behind the microphones and say it's a voting rights act. Okay. How is giving a politician six to one, so you give me $200 and the treasury is going to multiply it by six times? Is that defending democracy or is that once again the left being so much smarter than Republicans are on how to try to stay in power? How about some of the other things that are in the Democrats, H.R. 1 and H.R. 4, their federal election bill? Um, and my theory is a little different than other folks. It's just a blatant power grab. And, and it's, it's, more, it's not a power grab for the federal government, which it is that, but it's much more than that. It's a power grab by a party. 
that basically is trying to design the election code to fit their fundraising model, their campaign model. So it does other things, like um, down here, my state for functioning 20, well, uh, 18 years has had voter ID laws. Every data set out there says, you can't find a differential of populations not being able to vote. Matter of fact, I think in my state, some of the underlying data is African-American females are the highest participation. It's actually um, white males, particularly white rural males, that have some of the lowest participation, and some of my Native Americans. But that doesn't meet the folklore that we get from our brothers and sisters on the left. But think about this. And this is the circle I want folks who are paying attention to get their heads around how it works. So the Democrats push a voting rights bill, but it's really about voting mechanics. And what they do is they say, hey, we're going to have same day automatic registration. And then we're going to legalize, industrialize ballot harvesting. And then at the same time, we're going to do this so um, they also are allowed to have, if you give them money, they get six to one. So why would you do that? Well, first off, as in California, the Democrats have built a huge infrastructure. If you run for Congress, you actually take a substantial portion of your campaign money and hire firms that go knock on doors and harvest ballots. It's, it's now a campaign mechanic. Well, what happens if you hire lots of people to go walk through that massive apartment building or this and that and knock on the doors, hey, I'll register you right here, let's do your ballot. That's functionally what they're doing in this legislation. And the beauty of it it will ultimately be taxpayers who will be financing it because the left, to their credit, has spent about the last 15, 20 years building an online contribution system. And here's the kicker. That online contribution system has trained contributors to the left, contributors to Democrats, to say, don't give one person this much money, give 10 people this much. And it's as if it's always been laid out that's saying, and wink, wink, nod, day, nod, one day, we're going to set up a public funding system so your $25 contribution or $200 contribution gets multiplied six times. I mean, you got to give, you got to give the left, you got to give the Democrats credit, they're, they're just audacity. And then to call it a civil rights voting bill, when, when you break through its mechanics, it's about power. It's about power and control. That's what this is. And the other beauty is handing the bureaucracy here in Washington, D.C., the functionality of saying, they can tell my state of Arizona what's allowed and what isn't allowed. Um, we have a family saying that goes, money, power, vanity, but most of the time it's about the money. In this case, I've got to give the left credit. They hit all three in the same piece of legislation. You know, it becomes about the money, it becomes about them keeping the power. But reality has almost nothing to do with fairness. It's about the fear that the public understands how much of the left's policies have been crappy to them, their families, this country. And the mechanism they're going to try to keep in power is to functionally have us finance their elections and allow them to industrialize the very bad acts that so many of us worry about. And with that, Madam Speaker, I think I feel a little better getting some of that out of my system, so I yield back. The, the gentleman yields.